Ian Simpson won the 1994 British Sports Bike Championship and never got paid a penny for it. Norton, the company he rode for, was already bankrupt, and the engine that beat Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki, and Ducati was banned the next season. In 1994, a 588cc Norton rotary, built in a caretaker's shed, humiliated Honda's RC45 across an entire British racing season. Norton had been dead for two years, but their engine refused to die. Honda couldn't beat it on the track, so they killed it in the rulebook. This is the story of the outlaw engine that terrified the Japanese factories and buried Norton twice. By 1984, Norton was building motorcycles for police departments, not race bikes, not superbikes, police bikes that overheated in traffic jams and broke down on patrol routes. The company had collapsed and reformed so many times that nobody could track who owned what anymore. BSA had merged with Norton back in 1973, then immediately went bankrupt. Norton inherited a weird rotary engine project that BSA had been developing. Nobody knew what to do with it. The rotary used a spinning triangular rotor instead of pistons moving up and down. Fewer moving parts meant smoother power delivery, but the engine had serious problems. It ran dangerously hot. It burned oil constantly. The seals blew out, requiring expensive repairs. Norton stuffed the rotary into a bike called the Interpol 2 and sold 350 of them to British police forces. The cops hated them. The bikes overheated in city traffic. The engine seized without warning. The maintenance costs were ridiculous. By 1985, Norton made maybe a few hundred bikes per year. The factory in Shenston looked like it was one bad month away from closing permanently. That's when Brian Crichton showed up and decided to prove everyone wrong. Brian Crichton was a three-time British 50cc champion who became a service engineer at Norton in 1984. His job was maintaining the terrible police bikes and handling angry customer complaints about seized engines. Crichton looked at the rotary and saw potential nobody else could. Management told him the engine was maxed out at 85 horsepower. There was nothing more to extract. Crichton disagreed. In his spare time, working nights and weekends in the caretaker's shed, he started modifying a scrapped police bike engine. He spent his own money on parts. Norton management told him he was wasting his time. After months of work, Crichton demonstrated what he had achieved. He had boosted power from 85 horsepower to 120 horsepower. That was a 41% increase. Management remained skeptical. In 1987, Crichton loaded his prototype into a van and drove it to the Motor Industry Research Association test track in Nuneaton. He clocked 170 miles per hour on a bike that management had written off as worthless. That single test run changed everything. Management suddenly saw potential where they'd only seen problems before. Norton decided to go racing, but they had no money for a proper program. No sponsor backing, no racing team infrastructure. Just Crichton's prototype and a desperate hope that winning races might save the dying company. The rotary had no pistons, no connecting rods, no camshafts, no valves. You couldn't modify it like a normal engine. Crichton treated it like a two-stroke. He changed the internal ports controlling air and fuel flow. He designed the exhaust system to create a vacuum effect that pulled cooling air through the engine while extracting more power. The breakthrough was the ejector exhaust. High-velocity exhaust gases created suction that pulled cool air through the engine's internals. This solved the overheating problem. It also freed up massive horsepower. By late 1987, Crichton had a race-ready bike. The engine was stuffed into an aluminum frame built by Spondon Engineering. The whole bike weighed about 300 pounds. The engine made 130 horsepower or 140 horsepower with ram air at high speed. The bike debuted at Darley Moore Circuit. Malcolm Heath rode it to third place. Norton was shocked. This thing could actually race. In 1989, Norton fielded a proper team with riders Steve Spray and Simon Buckmaster. The rotary was fast, so they started winning immediately. At Brands Hatch in late 1988, the rotary dominated the Power Bike International race. Steve Spray destroyed the competition, and that performance caught the attention of John Player's special cigarettes. JPS had sponsored Norton in the 1970s, and when they saw this, they decided to come back. For 1989, JPS pumped serious money into Norton. The bikes got the iconic black and gold livery. Trevor Nation and Steve Spray led the lineup, and the team had backing from Dunlop, Duckham's Oil, and proper sponsorship money. The 1989 season was total domination. Norton won race after race. Nation and Spray took both the 750cc Super Cup Championship and the British F1 title. British fans went crazy. A home-built bike was beating the Japanese factories at their own game. The media couldn't get enough of the story. A nearly bankrupt British company with a weird engine nobody believed in was destroying Honda, Yamaha, and Kawasaki. Sports journalists wrote articles about the underdog story. Television crews showed up at the races to film the black and gold Norton bikes. The rotary became a symbol of British engineering fighting back against Japanese domination. But success created problems. Management clashed with Crichton over technical direction. They brought in Barry Simmons, an ex-Honda team manager, to run the racing program. 
Simmons wanted to change Crichton's designs, and this made Crichton quit Norton at the end of 1990. The team kept winning, though, in 1991, Ron Haslam joined and finished second in the British Championship, but Norton owed £7 million in debt. The same year, the Rotary achieved its greatest victory. The 1992 Isle of Man Senior TT is still considered one of the best motorcycle races ever run. Steve Hislop had just quit Yamaha after one race, claiming they hadn't given him the promised equipment. Norton team boss Barry Simmons offered him a ride at the TT. Norton barely had £25,000 to fund the effort. ABUS locks and EBC brakes scraped together £10,000. The Isle of Man Tourist Board contributed another £10,000. Nobody thought the Rotary could survive six laps of the punishing 37.73 mile TT course. The engine ran hot. It was fragile. So racing it for 228 miles in summer heat seemed suicidal. His lop's rival was Carl Fogarty, riding a Yamaha OW01. Fogarty had replaced his lop at Yamaha and was determined to prove himself. The two riders were complete opposites. Fogarty was loud and aggressive. His lop was quiet and calculated. In the Formula 1 TT earlier that week, his lop finished second after the team removed the front mudguard mid-race to improve cooling. The Norton was barely holding together. For the senior TT, the team made basic modifications. They fitted a taller windscreen, kept the front mudguard off, and widened the handlebars. That was all they could afford. Race day was hot and sunny. This was perfect for spectators, but it was hell for Norton. Fogarty started at number 4. Hislop started at number 19, over a minute behind on the road. They never saw each other during the race, but the timing screens told the story. The lead changed constantly. They were never more than 7.4 seconds apart. His lot rode smooth and precise. Fogarty rode like he was trying to destroy the bike. The Yamaha started falling apart. The exhaust broke. Fixtures rattled loose. Fluid leaked, but Fogarty kept pushing. On the final lap, Fogarty set a new lap record at 123.61 miles per hour. He crossed the finish line first because he started earlier. Then everyone waited. The Norton had to cross within seconds or Fogarty would win. The white Norton howled into view. His lot took the checkered flag 4.4 seconds ahead after nearly two hours of racing. It was the first time Norton had won the senior TT since 1961. It was also the greatest victory the Rotary would ever achieve. Three months later, Norton went bankrupt owing £7 million. In 1992, Norton collapsed completely. The company went into liquidation. Philippe Leroux, the chairman, had been investigated for financial improperties. The factory was sold to Canadian company Wild Rose Ventures in 1993 for about half a million pounds. The new owners had zero interest in racing. They were asset stripping. And so the racing team was disbanded. The JPS sponsorship ended. The factory team was dead. But Brian Crichton still had his rotary engine. He had left Norton in 1990, but he kept developing the design. In 1993, he formed a new team with Colin Seeley, a legendary frame builder. They called it the Duckham's Norton team after their oil sponsor. For 1994, Crichton signed Ian Simpson, a 24-year-old Scot who had won some 400cc and 600cc championships but never raced superbikes. Simpson also agreed to race a Yamaha 600 in the Supersport class. Why? Because Crichton couldn't pay him. Simpson rode the Norton for free. He only raced the 600 because that's where he could earn prize money. Colin Seeley didn't want Simpson doing both championships, but Simpson had already agreed contracts with Avon Tires and Yamaha. He had to race both bikes to survive. The Norton Rotary in 1994 was the final evolution of Crichton's design. It still made around 135 horsepower, roughly the same as the factory Honda RC45s and Ducati 916s, but the Norton weighed about 135 kilograms, making it significantly lighter. This meant it could brake later and could turn faster. It was a scalpel competing against hammers. The engine still had no throttle, and it ran wide open all the time. The rider controlled power using the spark advance and a kill switch. This made the bike incredibly difficult to ride. The power delivery was like an on-off switch. When you closed the throttle and leaned into the corner, the lack of engine braking pushed the front wheel wide. Simpson described his first experience. How the F does anybody go so quick on this thing? It took him four meetings to figure it out. He had to be smoother on the throttle. He had to accept the bike would push the front end in every corner. He had to adapt his entire riding style. The 1994 British Superbike season ran 11 rounds with 22 races. Simpson won the Supersport 600 Championship almost immediately, taking three wins from the first three rounds. But on the Norton, it took until the fifth round at Alton Park before he won his first Superbike race. Then he started dominating. Simpson took both races at Alton Park, both races at Knockhill, a first and second at Pembury. His teammate Phil Borley also started winning. 
Between Simpson and Borley, Norton won nearly every race for the rest of the season. Simpson wrapped up the Super Sport 600 title with a round to spare. The Superbike Championship went down to the final round at Brands Hatch. Simpson won the opening race ahead of Borley and sealed the title. He had become the first rider to win both the Superbike and Supersport Championships in the same year. During this season, Simpson often had to cut his podium appearances short because he needed to get back out on another bike for the next race. Colin Seeley would coordinate with race officials to make sure there was a race scheduled between the Supersport and Superbike events so Simpson had time to switch bikes and change leathers. Simpson never received a single pound from Norton for winning the championship. The factory was being stripped for assets. His only income came from the Supersport series and prize money. The irony was brutal. Simpson had just achieved something no other rider in British history had done. He'd won two national championships in the same year on completely different bikes. Sponsors should have been lining up to put their logos on his leathers. Instead, he was scrambling to make rent because the bike he won the Superbike title on came from a company that no longer existed. Honda, Yamaha, Ducati, and Kawasaki all hated the Norton Rotary. For years, they complained that the rotary had an unfair advantage. The problem was measuring engine displacement. A rotary doesn't have cylinders like a normal engine. The Federation Internationale de Motocyclisme had declared that Norton's 588cc twin rotary engine should be rated at 1000cc for racing purposes. This was supposed to level the playing field. But the weight advantage remained. The rotary was compact and light. A conventional four-cylinder superbike engine weighed significantly more. The frame had to be heavier. The whole package ended up being 20 to 30 kilograms heavier than the Norton. After Simpson won the 1994 championship, the complaints got louder. The Japanese manufacturers argued Norton had an unfair advantage. They lobbied the British Super Cup organizers to change the rules. For 1995, new homologation rules were introduced. Any bike competing had to have a certain number of road-going versions produced. The rules required manufacturers to build enough street bikes to prove the racing version was based on a real production model. Norton couldn't afford to build street versions of the Rotary Racer. The company was bankrupt and being asset stripped. Building production bikes was impossible. Brian Crichton later stated, After winning the 94 championship, we were banned. I think Honda were a bit fed up with us beating the RC45. The Norton Rotary was effectively banned from British Superbike Racing starting in 1995. Colin Seeley's team switched to Honda RC45s. The Rotary Racing program was dead. Norton's Rotary won races from 1988 through 1994, seven years of success, multiple championships, the 1992 TT victory, the 1994 British Superbike title, lap records at every circuit in Britain, yet none of it saved the company. Norton had been dying since the 1970s, multiple bankruptcies, multiple owners, constant financial problems. The Rotary racing program always ran on a shoestring budget. Even with JPS sponsorship, the team barely had enough money to compete. The company's road bikes failed to sell. The classic and F1 models based on the Rotary Racer generated interest at shows, but dealers couldn't move them. Production numbers were tiny. The bikes were expensive and unreliable. Customers who bought them faced constant maintenance issues. By the time Norton went bankrupt in 1992, the racing team's success meant nothing. The company owed £7 million. The factory was sold. The assets were liquidated. Ian Simpson's 1994 championship came two years after the company died. He won on a bike built by a private team using technology from a bankrupt manufacturer. The victory was impressive, but pointless. There was no Norton factory to capitalize on the win, no marketing department to sell bikes based on racing success, no production line to build replicas. The Rotary had proven that British engineering could still beat Japanese, but proving a point doesn't pay debts. Racing success doesn't fix cash flow problems. Winning championships doesn't make production bikes reliable enough to sell. And then came the ban that made sure Norton stayed dead. The 1994 homologation rules killed any chance of the Rotary returning to British racing. Other race series followed suit. The Rotary became a historical curiosity instead of a competitive option. Some claim the ban was justified. The Rotary was difficult to classify. Its unique design made displacement comparisons with conventional engines problematic. Racing organizers wanted production-based competition, and Norton couldn't produce enough street bikes to qualify. Others saw it as the Japanese manufacturers using their influence to eliminate a competitor they couldn't beat on track. Honda had watched their RC45 lose races to an underfunded British team running an unconventional engine. The ban came immediately after Norton's greatest season. The timing was suspicious. 
For six years, the Rotary had raced under the same displacement rules without major complaints. Then Simpson won the championship convincingly and suddenly the rules needed to change for 1995. The manufacturers claimed they wanted fair competition. What they really wanted was for the embarrassing losses to stop. Brian Crichton believed Honda pushed for the rule changes. Whether that's true or not, the result was the same. The Rotary was out and Norton Racing was finished. A few Rotary bikes appeared at the Isle of Man TT in subsequent years. Michael Dunlop rode an updated version in 2009, but the bikes never returned to mainstream British racing. The rule changes made sure of that. Now, what happened to the people who built the Rotary? Brian Crichton had left Norton in 1990 after clashes with management, but he continued developing rotary engines independently. He spent years working on Rotron Power, an aerospace company that builds rotary engines for drones and aircraft. In 2021, Crichton unveiled the CR700W, a 690cc rotary track bike making 220 horsepower and weighing just 129.5 kilograms. He had built only 25 by hand, each cost about 95,000 pounds. The bike sold quickly to collectors who remembered the Norton's rotary racing glory. Crichton is now 74 years old. He never got rich from his rotary designs. Instead, he spent decades working in sheds and workshops, developing an engine concept that most people said was impossible to race successfully. He proved them all wrong. Ian Simpson went on to win three Isle of Man TT races and five Northwest 200 victories. He broke his legs four times during his career. The injuries finally forced him to retire in 2001 after he nearly lost his right leg. He never won another major championship after 1994, but that double championship on an autumn rotary and Yamaha 600 remains one of the most impressive achievements in British racing history. Steve Hislop won the British Superbike Championship in 1995 and 2002. He died in a helicopter accident in 2003 at age 41. His 1992 TT victory on the Norton Rotary is still considered his greatest race. Colin Seeley continued building frames and racing vintage bikes. His Duckham's Norton team represented the final chapter of the Rotary's racing story. Barry Simmons, the team manager who guided the Norton Rotary to its TT victory, left racing after the program ended. In 1994, Ian Simpson won the British Superbike Championship on a Norton Rotary built by a private team using technology from a bankrupt company. One year later, the Rotary was banned from British racing. The rulemakers claimed it didn't fit the production-based formula. The manufacturers claimed it had an unfair advantage. The truth was simpler. Nobody wanted to keep losing to a dead company's engine. The Norton Rotary was too good. It won too many races, it embarrassed too many factory teams, so they changed the rules and made sure it could never come back. Brian Crichton's rotary engine proved that British engineering could still compete at the highest level. It proved that unconventional thinking could beat unlimited budgets. It proved that a small team with no money could dominate a professional racing series. Then the rule makers banned it and everyone moved on. The rotary bikes now sit in museums. Collectors pay hundreds of thousands of pounds for original race bikes. Enthusiasts remember the black and gold JPS Nortons as symbols of British racing glory. But in 1994, the Rotary won a championship for a company that was already dead. The rider never got paid. And a year later, the engine that beat everyone was banned from racing ever again. That's the truth about the Norton 588cc Rotary. It was brilliant engineering. It killed the company. And when it kept winning anyway, they changed the rules to make it disappear. Would you race a bike with no throttle that runs at full power all the time? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you want more stories about machines that should never have worked but somehow did, subscribe and hit the notification bell.